First off, let me say thanks to all of you that once again took to Twitter to ask your questions. Got a lot of questions, probably more than I can reasonably answer in the purposes of a Q&A video. Uh, and beyond that, probably more questions than I can answer in just one Q&A video. So you'll probably see this being part one of two for the weekly Q&A. So thank you guys again so much for all the questions that you ask and certainly would encourage you after watching this part one to make sure that you check out part two. Uh, but without further ado, let's go ahead and start off with the questions, shall we? Little DJ Boy, longtime follower and viewer of the show, kicks us off by asking, isn't it telling how bad Ziggler is when in 2020 you like Balor and Sami Zayn, but not Dolph? First, <laughs> Dolph Ziggler! You know better. You know better, DJ. Come on now. Second, when in the hell did I ever suggest that I was a fan of Finn Balor all of a sudden? When did I say that I liked him? I don't recall that. This is news to me. Saying that I like Finn Balor right now is a bridge too far. Sami Zayn is completely and totally valid because I have seen the light. He is the current reigning and defending, and in my opinion, completely and totally undisputed, valid, 100% legitimate Intercontinental Champion. He is the babyface here. More can he really say? And Dolph sucked for a decade. What more can I really say? Volfan0531. How should WrestleMania 17 have ended? With Austin not turning heel. Probably would have been a good idea. Hey, we now own WCW. We we'll do whatever the hell we want. Let's go ahead and flip Austin heel. It was just a foreshadowing of the suck to come that was 2001 as a total for a year in professional wrestling. I hate that year so much with passion. Mount T's Corner. You have the choice to build your brand around five wrestlers. Who are they and why? Five wrestlers, any promotion, anywhere. Interesting. Roman's number one. Because, I mean, look at him. He is the top babyface in professional wrestling in the world. And there are two opinions you can have on that one. The opinion where you agree and the wrong opinion. So Roman is one. Number two, MJF. You need a heel that can talk, that can serve as foil. How about take him? Number three, probably Big E. I think I would take him. On number four, I, I see part of what I'm trying to do here, Mounty, is I'm trying to create kind of like a coalition of wrestlers because you know I want to be able to appeal to as many demographics as possible. So doing what most wrestling uh, companies would do and just build around a bunch of white people isn't going to work. Um, just reality. Uh, then you'll come back at me when I say the next name. You'll be like, what? Uh, but Luchasaurus? Yes. You need somebody that's kid-friendly. You need somebody that can have flexibility to work in a tag match, work in singles competition, work in a variety of slots on the card. And then the fifth one. Um, some of you would probably say, Okada, 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 which is exactly why I'm not going to say Okada. I need to have a woman in there somewhere. And I'll go Bianca Belair. I'm sorry, a lot of you disagree, and you're wrong. She has it. She has that quality. And she doesn't, unlike a Charlotte Flair or a Becky Lynch, have to be forced down your throats in order for that, what I feel like, to be pretty self-evident. So those would be the five that I would start off with. Uh, Byron Andreas, what do you think about the best friends versus the proud and powerful parking lot fight getting a five-star rating? Um, here's what I think about that. Why in the hell do people still care about Meltzer's star ratings? Why do we ever care about Meltzer's star ratings? They're so skewed and biased and based solely entirely off of his perspective of how he views wrestling. Always going to be slanted towards anything that mirrors any type of Japanese style, any hardcore shit. Like, he is not a storytelling guy. He is not an actual in-the-ring tell-a-story guy. He's not a character guy. He's a move and match mark. So stop giving a crap about his stupid star ratings. 
Especially when you're sitting there talking about the Okada Mega Matches. There's six and a quarter stars, six and a half stars, now the scale of seven stars, and all this other dumb shit. Like, why do people care about this? Why do they let it bother them? Why do they worry about it? Like, you know, when people say that Meltzer is irrelevant or insignificant to professional wrestling, there is nothing further from the truth. He is the representation in many ways of the significant seismic changes we have seen in the industry over the decades, and certainly not for the better. He has a large, powerful swath of influence over the business today, more than you could argue he ever has. So to sit there and say at this point in time that he is irrelevant is a complete disconnection from reality. But, that said, the five-star rating, who gives a crap? I enjoyed the match significantly. I thought it was great. I don't need to attach a stupid star rating to it uh, to quantify that. Kieran Chase. What has Seamus done to be a part of the Breakfast Club? Every club needs a slow man on the totem pole. Every club, like the Breakfast Club, needs its job guy. Seamus is that job guy. Seamus is the guy that serves as Triple H's lifting buddy and spotter and so forth. Like, these are undeniable facts. That's why Seamus is in the Breakfast Club. And number two is because I said so. And that's the only reason you really need, Kieran. Jesus. Unbelievable. The slang. The, the gall. The, ten, the audacity to ask such a question. Unbelievable. Lord JCW. Most underrated WWE pay-per-view of all time. Of all time. So now you're expecting me, in the heat of the moment of a Q&A video, to go through... Hundreds upon hundreds, thousands of WWE pay-per-views of all time, and tell you what I think is the most underrated one ever. Thanks a lot for nothing. Uh, I'll stick to a WrestleMania just because it's the first thing that kind of pops to my mind. Uh, I always felt WrestleMania 7 got a raw deal, and WrestleMania 7 for its moment in time and what it had going on, was a better show than it probably had any right to be. Uh, certainly it wasn't the box office success that the company had envisioned because they were originally planning on having it in the L.A. Coliseum and ticket sales were so bad they had to move it into the sports arena. But that's a show I always look back on with pretty fond memories and I think that is a show that just in general is kind of underrated. Uh, Rick Styles, next question. Ooh, this is a good one. Who's hotter, Sasha Banks, Naomi, Bianca Belair. I'm not huge on Sasha. Like, she doesn't make my bobber dip up and down, so I'm cool with her. That's a, that's a, that's a hard pass. I, like, I'm not saying she's ugly or anything, just not really my speed or flavor, if that makes sense. Uh, then we get to Naomi and Bianca Belair. Oh, fuck. You would ask me this. I hate you, Rick. I really, really do. Because how do I choose? Like, there's that element of Naomi would back it up to the point where she would hurt me. And I like that. And then she would like sit on my face and use me in a way at her discretion. That would just be fantastic. And it would be like, that's what I'm totally there to be for. On the flip side, there's something about Bianca Belair. Like she could not just sit on me and fuck me up. Like she could literally fuck me up. You've got to remember, I'm a white boy. And we are some nasty, crazy, freaky fuckers. I mean, like, I can picture Bianca Belair waking up in the morning and saying, you, pleasure, now. And, of course, being the white boy, once you go white, you know you've been licked right. Da, 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 da. And, you know, just do my, do my duty, do my job. Uh, so it probably is going to be Bianca Belair. It's close, though. So. You kill me with that question. Per Shankar asked, what were your thoughts when Austin walked out of the WWE back in June 2002? Were you pissed at Austin for doing so or at Vince for putting him in that position? Also, do you think this whole situation could have been handled in a better way? Answer to your first question, yes and yes. Um, Austin picked up his ball and went home. That is true. Uh, also, totally understand what his point was is why in the hell would you give away him against Brock Lesnar in a King of the Ring qualifying match and not at least even do any build-up to it, let alone have that type of match at a pay-per-view? Like, that's just dumb. Like, that's a creative brain fart. 
Like that's the type of thing that if somebody suggested to you in a creative meeting and you are in Vince's position, you should immediately fire that person to show accountability that we will not tolerate that level of stupidity in this organization. So both of them are to blame. Austin could have found a better way to handle it. McMahon should have never put him in that position with that ridiculously dumb and stupid idea that was frankly just not smart for business. Um, also, do you think this whole situation could have been handled in a better way? Yeah, no kidding. Absolutely. Not trying to give away Austin and Brock on a freaking random raw would be a great place to start. All these years later, man, that was 18 years ago. God damn, I'm getting old. Uh, Liam Patrick, what's the best wrestling conspiracy theory? Uh, the best wrestling conspiracy theory. You know, there's so many different directions I could go, but I'll just go with the easy and obvious one, the Montreal Screwjob. Because after 23 years, you still have people that think that this was a shoot. Like, that is the conspiracy. Not that it's a work. It was a work. It might have got worked into a shoot. And especially from Bret Hart's perspective. Like, you can have it be a work and be totally planned and orchestrated and choreographed and not let one of the participants know. I think that's sometimes what people don't understand. But to sit there and believe this was a 100% real deal shoot? Like, look up the, the Black Spider incident. Moolah and Wendy Richter. Like, they lived, the company literally started the path to doing this 12 years ago. Or 12 years before. Like, the conspiracy to me is, for two plus decades, you have a lot of people running around thinking that this was 100% a shoot. That's the conspiracy. It's not that it was a work. The work is the more believable thing. The work is the thing that has significantly more evidence supporting it. That's not the conspiracy. As far as I'm concerned, that's the truth. The conspiracy is, this was real and Brett got screwed. Give me a break. The son of a promoter being stupid. Like, you just think about all these things and you, and you got to ask yourself, really? Like, how dumb do you have to believe to be, the, be to believe that, really? Christian Mingle. Jeff, I was watching Monty Brown highlights on YouTube. Great way to spend any day. Pounce, baby. How in the hell did TNA and WWE screw him up? How? WWE? It was because he was a TNA guy, and you know the other reason. I don't even need to say it. As far as TNA goes, it was because he was actually connecting with fans. It was because he was actually over, and because a certain Memphis mid-card piece of crap slap nuts just couldn't have anybody be over more than him, even though it didn't take much. They made sure to undercut that very quickly. This, this still evokes a lot of pain for me all these years later. Like Monty Brown should have been a world champion for them several times over. Mojo Jojo. In an ODQ match, who wins? Sid's leg, draws his neck, James Ellsworth's chin, or China's clit? China's clit? Really? Really? She wouldn't even have one anymore because she's dead. Like, wow. Um, <laughs> you already know my answer. <laughs> there is only one. If you put on a list of anything that says what wins and you start off with Sid's leg, you know that's winning. That is superstar stuff right there. He got on the second row because Johnny is asking to expand his office in front of the top. And as he's laying on the ring, crawled in the position, <laughs> Steiner bumps into his broken leg. The match still continues as Sid is laying on the ground the whole time. <laughs> poor, poor Sid. It was a sin. Oh, you see what I did there? <laughs> uh, and that's it for this Q&A. <laughs> I can get to gather my composure now. Uh, I try to keep these videos 15 minutes or less as much as possible just for um, my purposes uh, and for your purposes, frankly. <laughs> I, I know I have fun at Saints Expense still all these years later, but damn it, he was a star! He was a stud! And not just on the softball field, okay? You bring Psycho Sid into the business today, you'd say, Braun who? Braun boo who? Get to stepping, bitch! When they have a chance. Sid walking in with that golden, curly, permed mullet. Fantastic. Miss Sid. Anyways, thanks again for your questions for this Q&A. This was part one. I hope you enjoyed it.
Part two will be coming up soon. I will see you then. Thank you.